In this video, I'll be going through the 2022 WAVES paper. Question 1. Helen is investigating wave behaviour in the school physics laboratory. She starts by shining a ray of light from air into a glass block so that the angle of light inside the glass is 32 degrees, as shown in the diagram. The refractive index of glass is 1.52, the refractive index of air is 1, and the speed of light in air is 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. Calculate the angle of incidence. We can describe refraction with Snell's law, where we can set n1 as our refractive index in air, which means that theta1 is what we're trying to find our incident angle, n2 is our refractive index in glass, and 32 is our theta2. Solving this equation for theta1, dividing both sides by n1, and now taking the inverse sine of both sides. Putting our numbers in, which gives me 54 degrees to two significant figures. The light changes direction as it enters the block. State what happens to the speed of the light as it enters the glass. Because the refractive index of glass is higher than air, the speed of light is going to decrease. Calculate the speed of light within the glass block. The equation for the refractive index of a material is C divided by the velocity of the wave in that material, where we can solve for V by swapping the N and the V. Putting our numbers in, gives me 1.97 times 10 to the 8 meters per second to three significant figures. Helen now uses a semicircular block and alters the angle that the light hits the straight side, and she observes the following phenomena. Judging from the video at this link, I'm going to guess that the image that was here was going to look something like this. Where we have our light ray entering the glass block, reflecting off the glass air interface, and then exiting the glass block again. This physics phenomenon is called total internal reflection. Describe the two conditions required for this phenomenon to occur. The first condition is that if we imagine our boundary and our normal line, in order for total internal reflection to occur, our ray must be bending away from the normal. This will only occur if we're moving from a high refractive index to a lower. The ray must be moving from a high refractive index towards a lower. The second condition is that the incident angle must be greater than the critical angle. Helen then investigates a concave lens. She places a pin at a distance of 7 cm in front of the lens and finds that she cannot form an image on the screen. The lens has a focal length of 3 cm. Complete the following ray diagram and use calculations to describe and explain why she cannot see the image on the screen. Let's first complete our ray diagram. Our first ray is going to go parallel to the axis and then refract away from our focal. Our second ray is going to go straight through the middle, and our third ray is going to go toward the focal on the other side, and then refract parallel. As we can see, our rays are diverging, meaning we need to backtrace virtual rays, giving us an image right here. And immediately we can see that the reason that she cannot project this onto a screen is because it is a virtual image, meaning that the rays don't converge in real space. But because the question asks, we must also do a calculation. What we need to show is that our di is negative. So we can start with Descartes' law. Solve for di by subtracting 1 over do from both sides and swapping them around. Now taking the inverse of both sides, and putting our numbers in. And because we have a concave lens, our focal length is negative, which gives me negative 2.1 centimeters. And so as the negative DI and ray diagram show, the image is virtual and therefore cannot be projected onto a screen. Question two. Helen decides to investigate wave movement and barriers. She starts by shining a purple light with a frequency of 7.5 times 10 to the 14 hertz on the wall. Calculate the wavelength of the purple light. We know that wave velocity is frequency times wavelength, where we know our frequency. And we also know that our velocity is the speed of light, 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. Solving this for wavelength by dividing both sides by frequency. Putting our numbers in gives me 4.0 times 10 to the negative 7 meters to two significant figures. 
She finds an online simulator of wave movement through a gap in a barrier. She sets up two simulations below, complete the diagrams to show the effect of the gap on the waves. Here we have a large wavelength compared with our barrier, and here we have a short wavelength compared with our barrier. The behavior we're going to see is diffraction. We're going to see more bending around for our comparatively large wavelength than we will for our comparatively small wavelength. She then shines the same light through a double slit and observes the following pattern formed on a screen. Complete a labeled wave diagram to show how this phenomenon occurs. So we now need to draw a 2D interference pattern, which is one of the more annoying and finicky diagrams to draw. I'm going to try my best. Where we have an antinodal line here, and also here and here, and nodal lines in between. To get full marks for this question, your diagram doesn't need to be perfect. For the full merit point, you just need to show diffraction from each of these gaps, and label at least one correct antinodal and nodal line. Use physics principles to describe and explain how the pattern in part C is formed. Start by naming the phenomenon that is taking place, and then discussing the conditions required for the pattern to form. This is a 2D interference pattern. Each gap behaves like an individual source, producing curved wave fronts as the waves diffract. Constructive interference occurs where peaks meet peaks and troughs meet troughs, forming an antinodal line. Destructive interference occurs where peaks meet troughs, resulting in a nodal line. At antinodal lines, waves meet in phase and result in a doubled amplitude. At nodal lines, waves meet out of phase, resulting in cancellation. Question 3. Helen continues to investigate light and optics. She chooses to look at the images formed by convex lenses and then compares these with mirrors. She starts by placing a lamp in front of the lens and looking at the image formed on a screen. Complete the following ray diagram for the lamp placed at 3 cm from a convex lens of focal length 2 cm. Our first ray starts off parallel and then refracts through the focal point. Our second ray goes straight through the middle, and our third ray goes through the focal, and then refracts parallel. Not the straightest diagram, but we can still see that we have our image roughly here. Helen then tries the same lamp in front of a convex mirror of the same focal length 2cm and the same distance away 3cm. Complete the ray diagram. Our first ray goes parallel to the axis and then away from the focal. Our second ray refracts symmetrically about the middle and our third ray goes towards the focal and then reflects parallel. As we can see, all of these rays are diverging, meaning that we have to backtrace them virtually. Giving us an image roughly here. Describe the image produced. It is virtual, diminished, and upright. To further investigate waves, Helen looks at the effect of sending a pulse down a rope, firstly with a fixed end and then with a free end. Complete the diagrams below to show the reflected pulses from each system. Our fixed end reflection is going to be upside down, whereas our free end is going to be upright. The wavelength is going to be unchanged in both cases. Helen wanted to see if she could create a virtual image with a concave mirror. Use a ray diagram to show how this is possible. A concave mirror will produce a virtual image if the object is within the focal. So if we draw our mirror axis here, and our focal length here, our first ray reflects symmetrically about the middle, our second ray goes parallel, and then through the focal. As we can see, these two rays are diverging, meaning we need to backtrace them to find our virtual image which is roughly here. Describe the position of the object in relation to the mirror. The object is inside the focal length. Compare the similarities and differences of the image, if any, with a virtual image formed by a convex mirror. The convex image is diminished, whereas the concave image is enlarged. Both are upright. And we're done.